My name is Steve Culver. I have successfully made two spiral welded Damascus gun barrels and I've built those two barrels into functioning firearms. So I have a little bit of experience working with spiral welded Damascus barrels. Now I have here on my bench two Damascus barrel tubes. These are tubes that are uh, unfinished Damascus barrel tubes. They've never been bored out. They've never been turned into finished barrels. I got both of these tubes from Peter Dyson. He lives in the UK. Um, Peter has a supply of these barrel tubes and you can buy them from him. I'll show a photo of his contact information. This tube I bought from Peter. I believe this is probably the fore end of a 20 gauge barrel. This piece of tube here Peter gave me along with a challenge. Um, I have been asked by some firearms historians where Damascus pistol barrels came from. Um, there's tens of thousands of neat old pistols out there that have Damascus gun barrels. And there's virtually no documentation of where those came from. Who made them? There's nothing that specifically talks about making Damascus pistol barrels. Everything we have discusses making Damascus shotgun barrels. Now, there's very little writing at all on the subject of Damascus barrels. One place that there is some writing is this book by W.W. W. Greener. It's uh, The Gun and Its Development. And uh, Greener wrote this contemporary to his company making Damascus barrels. And there's a little information in there. And in that book, uh, Greener does mention briefly making a rifle barrels that they were made out of thicker ribbon and were welded on smaller welding mandrels. Other than that, there's no mention at all of making Damascus barrels for ball or bullet barrels. Um, one other source of old Damascus barrel information is this video sold on DamascusBarrels.com. I'll put up the information on that. This is actually a silent movie made around 1925 in Belgium of original barrel smiths actually making barrels. But anyway, because there's not uh, any real information contemporary to making them barrels that specifically talks about making pistol barrels, I have my own theory of where those barrels came from. And I believe that many of those barrels were simply reforged shotgun barrel tubes. Now I'm sure there was a lot of original shotgun barrel tubes that had some sort of defect along their length, so there was something wrong that would keep them from being made into a full length shotgun barrel tube. But I'm sure there was plenty of material in those barrels if you cut them up that could be reforged into pistol barrels. Back to Peter Dyson and his challenge to me. I've known Peter for several years, and I once stopped by his table at the Antique Arms Show just to chat with him. During our conversation, Peter mentioned that he has a lot of people wanting to buy his Damascus shotgun barrel tubes to make pistols out of. The problem is the bores in those shotgun tubes are too large to make pistol barrels out of. So I told Peter my theory that perhaps Damascus pistol barrel tubes are simply forged down shotgun barrel tubes. With that, Peter picked up a section of shotgun barrel tube off his table, he hands it to me, and he says, so go make me a pistol barrel out of this. So this video is to document my reforging of Peter's shotgun tube into a pistol barrel and to also provide plausible evidence that this could have been the source for antique Damascus pistol barrels. The reason I believe that many of these old pistol barrels were reforged shotgun tubes is because of my experience in making my own barrels. Now when I wind ribbon for my own barrels, it must be wound around a mandrel just like the old barrel smiths did. I have discovered, and this is actually one of my winding mandrels, I have discovered that there's a minimum size that I can effectively use as a winding mandrel. It has to be strong enough to resist the forces of winding that steel around it. 
And the smallest mandrel that I could get to work right for me was 5 eighths of an inch in diameter. So 0.625 inches in diameter. Now the barrels I made were 45 caliber and 50 caliber. So being as I'm winding that on a mandrel that's much larger in diameter than what I intend the finished barrel to be, what I have to do is wind that ribbon into a coil, forge weld all those spiral turns and turn it into a solid tube, and then I have to take that barrel tube and forge it around the outside and actually reduce the entire diameter of that tube to a smaller diameter, pushing the bore of that tube down to a, a diameter of small enough that I can drill it back out to the caliber that I want to finish the barrel out at. So I really believe that many of those pistol barrels came from old shotgun tubes that were just reforged. And it's honestly not a difficult process, and it's one that I believe any competent blacksmith could do. You actually have to forge the bore of the barrel tube down significantly smaller than what is required to make the bore of the, the finished barrel. I'll try to give a video or a film the inside of this tube. I don't know if it's possible to see in there with this, but the inside of these, these finished forgings, the hole is extremely ugly. drilling one of these tubes out, you've got to take a significant amount of material out to straighten out the hole, to get the ugliness out of it, um, cut out all the, the unclosed welds, the open welds inside of it, and get out into the Damascus far enough that you're into solid Damascus material. So you really have to push these down a lot smaller. For a 45 caliber barrel, I forged the bore down to one eighth of an inch and then drilled it back out to 45 caliber. I'm going to be trying to do a similar thing to this. Now as I said, in trying to push this barrel tube down as small as possible, I might consider taking that chemise out first. As it is, and being as this is really the first attempt to forge down an old tube, I'm going to go ahead and leave the chemise in there and we're going to see what becomes of it. Now I myself will be using the forging mandrels during the early part of my process, again to control forging it down, it, it also helps in case of errantly over intensive hammering that you don't crush the bore of the barrel, but I'll gradually be pulling this out and, and forging it down around the end of the mandrel until I force it down as small as I can with the mandrel. Means I'm wanting to forge that bore in that tube as small as I can, I will eventually not be able, to, be able to use a mandrel and I will proceed to use just a set of tongs to hold that barrel tube and run it in the trip hammer. Now I will be interested to find out during that forging how well the spiral welds are made in this barrel tube and if they hold up under the forging. That is an extremely forceful process to forge a tube down. A tube is a very rigid structural element anyway, and when you're forging a small diameter tube with, say, half inch thick barrel walls, that's a very rigid element. It takes some really severe hammering to forge that down. Now I know during the welding of my barrel tubes and forging them down, if I had a weld that was not stuck good, during that forging process to make that tube smaller, it would blow those welds open. So that's one thing that gives me assurance on my barrels that I've got good welds. If it survives the process of forging it down, it will be a sound barrel tube and I have no worries of it blowing up during use. Now, these barrels are made out of, uh, we believe, wrought iron and very low carbon steel. This should be very soft material under the hammer and therefore easy to move with a hammer. I made my barrels out of modern steels, 
Modern steels with a high alloy content are very tough under the hammer. They're harder to move. During the forging of my barrels and trying to use my old trip hammer, it became a little bit frightening. In order to get that hammer to hit hard enough to move the material, I had to run the hammer at a very high speed, which means a lot of impacts per second, per minute, whatever. It really became almost uncontrollable because the hammer itself, with all those high speed impacts, virtually ripped the tube out of my tongs and I had a hard time holding it. So I'm interested to see how this goes and see if this is easier to move. Uh, if it is, I feel that it would only confirm that it was not a difficult process for blacksmiths to forge shotgun tubes down to smaller diameters and uh, turn them into pistol tubes. I'm going to put a micrometer on this barrel tube and check dimensions on it before I start forging. On the large end of the tube, we're at about 1.2 inches. It's rather awkwardly egg-shaped, but somewhere around 1.2 inches if I've got that in the camera. On the opposite end, the out OD on it, it's about 900 thousandths, 950, 40, whatever. Now the bore diameter at the muzzle Four hundred thirty five, four hundred and forty. The opposite end I know is larger, strangely. That's a half inch. A little over a half an inch, five oh seven, five ten, and four ninety that way. As you can see, the uh bores are pretty ugly in these things. I know when I uh I run a bore brush to it to clean it out and and uh, the bore brush was really loose on this end, didn't even touch, and then was tight down here. Um, lengthwise, this thing is almost exactly one foot long. Uh, one interesting thing that I discovered when I was forging my barrels, you would expect during the forging process of forging it smaller and going around and around the thing, it seems as though the tube ought to get longer. Strangely, it does not, or if it does, it only gets slightly longer. Very little at all. Uh, it doesn't make sense mathematically, but when hammering these tubes down, uh, it actually seemed as though the barrel walls were getting thicker. In forging it down, it was compressing material into the barrel walls, and making the barrel wall thicker. Uh, at the very least, the barrel wall maintained the same thickness as it was in, before I started forging it down. That in itself is odd because it takes quite a few heats during this forging process and during every heat I'm losing material at least on the outside of the tube to forge scale. So given that I'm losing material during the forging process and at the end of it, the barrel walls are at least the same thickness or thicker. It indicates to me that it's actually pounding material down into the barrel walls and making them thicker. And it does not move the material out laterally. Uh, so that's an interesting observation and one that I want to see holds up on this tube here. So when I get done forging this, we'll see if it's somewhere near a foot long.
I stopped work on the barrel tube and allowed it to cool down to show you some things uh, and uh, to reset the process. Uh, it's, the work's been going very good. An observation is, wow, this stuff is soft. It is like bubble gum when you're hammering on it. A lot different than the barrel tubes that I've made out of modern steel. Modern steel, I've got to run my trip hammer almost as fast as I can run it to, to reshape it and forge it down. And this stuff is extremely soft. It's almost frighteningly soft to move. Um, one thing I'll show here, something very obvious and the reason I stopped. As I mentioned earlier, I was curious how solid the welds were between the turns of the ribbon. And this thing has blown a weld. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try to weld that up. I am going to use some borax flux on it. Now it's, I've been told that the old barrel smiths did not use flux. Being these barrels is made out of wrought iron and low carbon steel, the silica in the wrought iron made it somewhat self-fluxing. But I'm using a propane forge rather than the coal or charcoal forges that they used. And so potentially this propane forge is a little bit worse of making oxidation that would interfere with the weld. So I'm going to flux that and try to re-weld it and we'll see how that goes. Worst case scenario, then just have to cut it off past the broken welds. Now one thing, uh, typically I didn't see much lengthening in the barrel tubes that I made. This was, this started out at about 12 inches long and right now it's at about 13. So it's lengthened nearly an inch. Now I would guess that a big reason for that, one that this material is so soft and also I have been forging it with the forging mandrel inside of it and using drawing dies that would tend to lengthen it. So with the mandrel inside of it, the die, the drawing dies are hitting on the mandrel and it is lengthening the tube out some. I don't really prefer to see that because that would tend to thin the barrel walls. And I want to leave as much wall material in there as possible uh, for the finishing process, but even having done that, I've taken some measurements. Now the outside of this tube when I started was at 940 thousandths of an inch. I don't know if I can even get this into. So right now, I'm at about 800 thousandths. I wanted to forge it down to three quarters of an inch or 750 thousandths. So I've got about another 50 thousandths to go. Um, the bore, which started out at 440, out here at the muzzle, it's measuring about oh seven or 280 or so. But I don't have the muzzle forged down as far as I want to go. It's forged closer back here. I put a quarter inch rod down this thing and I could just barely get a quarter inch rod through this area here. I didn't want to forge too much out on the muzzle with the trip hammer because this stuff is so soft I was afraid of crushing it. So my intention is to forge it down smaller here and I'll finish the muzzle with a hand hammer. At this point I still got a little bit more out here to forge with, at the muzzle with the hand hammer so it's measuring larger out here than what it actually is in this area. Now. In this area here, since this was tapered from a breech end, I still need to push it down some smaller in diameter here. And it's a little hard to determine while you're forging where this transition is between the straight tube and the drop off from the breech end. If during the finishing out of a barrel tube, you started drilling it out and found it was too large in here and wasn't cleaning out, what could be done is what Greener mentioned in his book. Occasionally they would have a tube that was not cleaning out in a certain area. They would send it back to the blacksmith and have them forge it down smaller in that area, push that area down in and then go back to drilling so, and clean that out. So potentially uh, somebody in the future is drilling this out and, it, and I've missed this 
and not got the bore forged down as small as it needs to be here, it could go back to a blacksmith, forge it down smaller in that area, and then go back to drilling again. Now, at this point, uh, one thing that was interesting, uh, I mentioned that the barrel walls never seem to thin any. Even though this thing is lengthened, by math, the thickness of the walls at the muzzle before I started were about a quarter of an inch. And right now, they're still right at that. So I really haven't lost any barrel wall thickness at the muzzle. Interesting. At the breech end, the barrel walls mathematically was 375, although it was awkward to measure because the, the breech end was kind of egg shaped. But I've only lost about 30 thousandths on the breech on the walls on the breech end, which isn't bad. And then having the this has not been forged down as small as it'll go. The I uh, don't know if I can even get it in the light, but the the bore diameter at the breech end, since I've still got some forging to do, I've only reduced it about 75 thousandths of an inch because it blew those welds well before I got a lot of reduction in diameter to occur in this end. So anyway, other than the welds blowing, this is going quite well, I feel. So I'm going to light the forge back up, flux up these bad welds and see if I can get them to stick, and continue forging this down some more, and we'll see how much farther we can push it and see what the results will be.
Well, I believe I'm going to stop with the forging process now. I think I've proven that this can be done. It did actually blow another weld here in the middle. And I got it stuck back together. And as you can see in the forging videos, uh, re-welding the open welds down here went great. And you can see a little line there, but it's not bad. That's only on the surface. I know those welds stuck. And you can tell that is a Damascus Smith. When a hot piece like this is cooling down, if you have a bad weld in it, it'll cool at different rates on either side of the bad weld, and you can see exactly where the break is at. And it's cooling down evenly, so I know those welds are stuck. Those small lines are where uh, oxidation ate off the corners of that open gap, and it's just hard to cover, fill them back in. You can do a little hammering around on the outside and push that back together and maybe get it closed up better than I did there, but that's really not bad. As far as results, don't know if I can get this in the camera, but wound up pretty good. I was shooting for specific dimensions. I wanted 750 thousandths on this end and missed that by a little bit. Not too bad. And I wanted 800 thousandths in the middle, and I, depending on where I measure at, I pretty much hit the 800 thousandths. And then I wanted one inch on the breech end, and I'm actually a little bit under that. But that's okay. It's only a few thousandths under. That's not bad. If you do use an eyeball to figure out where you finish forging, that's pretty close. As far as the bore, with the chemise in it now, I'm at about a quarter of an inch on both ends. It's a little bit larger on the on the breech end, not much. Well, there's a big gap, but trying to measure inside of that is uh, pretty hard to do. But anyway, that's about as far as I can push it. And examining this. I'm saying that this thing would probably finish out at 50 caliber, might go 45. You could probably forge it down smaller and still get 45 out of it. The uh, breech end has got enough wall thickness there that it would make a barrel that you could put a breech plug in. The forward end here might be able to breech plug it but it would at the very least make a barrel for like a screw barrel gun or a pepper box pistol. So that's good material out here. But then if you were able to drill this full length for a long pistol barrel, um, there's still, still sufficient wall thickness out here to be safe. Uh, even, um, you know, by the time the charge got down that far, it'd be safe. What I'm measuring here is I've got about a hundred and fifty thousandths of wall thickness on the outside of the chemise. So if you drilled out that chemise, of course I'll lose some on grinding the outside, drilled out that chemise, by the time you get done finishing, should be able to maintain yet about a hundred thousandths of wall thickness out on the muzzle. So, turned out pretty good, I think. Um, again, this stuff is amazingly soft and easy to work. I, I owe that primarily, that and the ease of closing up the open welds, I owe that to the silica content of the wrought iron material that's in there. And, uh, I, and noticing, well, the wrought iron kind of with the silica content makes it somewhat self-flexing. And it also helps to protect the, the, the iron-based material from oxidation inside the forge. And, Looking at the amount of forge scale that's on my floor right now, I would say it's probably about 50% of what I would expect to see after doing that kind of forge work on modern steel. So I'd say the silica in this stuff is really helping to protect it. Now I'm going to take this over the belt grinder, scuff off all this stuff, grind it down, maybe throw it in some uh, ferric chloride for a quick etch, and we'll have another look at it. So here we have it. I've done the grinding on it, throw the light etch on it, 
One thing you'll immediately notice is that there's two types of Damascus in this barrel, which is perhaps why Peter gave it to me to work with, because it's kind of an oddball. And interestingly, where it blew the welds, down here in the middle, is where these two rods were scarf welded together. And then of course, where the original broken weld was that I got healed up really good, um, that's down there in that oddball material as well. I don't know what that indicates. Maybe this was a uh, practice tube by an apprentice blacksmith. <laughs> but uh, it is an oddball piece, and it's interesting that these welds come apart where those two were scarf welded together, whatever that means. But this part down here has got a very nice pattern to it, and hope you can see that in this video. And uh, as far as the ends of the barrel and the, you can see the chemise in, in the brief, that's the muzzle end of it. There's still wall thickness outside the chemise. On the breech end, same thing. The chemise is actually smaller there, but there's a lot of wall thickness left there to, to work with. Maybe put a breech plug in, so all in all, I'd say this barrel would be sufficient for making into some kind of a pistol barrel. And uh, length, I didn't check earlier. Talked about lengthening the tube during the forging. Right now, this wound up at about 13 and 3 8 inches. So during the entire forging process, that tube lengthened an inch and 3 8 And again, that even is surprising to me. I'd say due to the softness of the material and the fact that I was using drawn dies and perhaps a process where I was using the forging mandrel inside of it, which gave the dies something to forge against on the inside. That probably helped to promote the lengthening of it, but I don't think that's too bad. But I guess here we have it. A pistol barrel forged out of an old raw shotgun barrel tube forging. I'm Steve Culver, and thank you very much.